Hi everybody! Um, back by popular demand, it is more of the sci-fi story. Uh, you guys are apparently really enjoying it, um, and I'm really enjoying reading it. So I'm gonna keep doing that! Uh, so, when last we left our heroes, uh, Daniel had received a mysterious envelope from a falafel place, and had resolved to open it the next moment he was alone. And now, we continue. As it so happened, however, that moment did not come until six in the evening, when he arrived home after work. He closed the door and heard it lock, just before the automatic butler booted up. Good evening, sir, it said. Daniel jumped. I thought I turned you off, he cried. Indeed, sir. I am programmed to reboot once every twenty-four hours. And forget everything you've been told? Turn off. Yes, sir, the automatic butler replied, sourly, so Daniel thought. Its holographic body winked out. Daniel went into his shower, the one place in his house he had discovered that the automatic butler did not have eyes, and closed the door, using his phone to supplement the diffuse light that seeped through the frosted glass. In the bright glare of the LEDs, he took the crumpled envelope out of his pocket. As the store manager had claimed, it was not sealed, and there was no evidence that it ever had been. Daniel briefly wondered who had managed to get their hands on a paper envelope, and how, before he pulled out the letter inside. It was a half-sheet of wide-ruled notebook paper, and the writing was scribbled. Project Code 9441. Ask B for password. Daniel turned the note over, but there was nothing written on the other side. He examined it from several different angles, shined the light through it from behind, and even scrutinized the envelope, but to no avail. There was but one message on the paper, one message contained in the envelope. He carefully slid the paper back in the envelope and put both back in his pocket. He decided he could safely leave it there and put it through the wash. The note would be destroyed without the automatic butler ever seeing it. He wasn't sure why he thought the butler shouldn't be allowed to see the note, but his conviction was very strong, and he preferred to err on the side of caution. Daniel spent the rest of the evening being consciously casual. He made certain to go through all of his usual routine, routines in as calm and detached a manner as possible. He checked his email and various social networking sites, played an hour or so of video games, read a chapter of his current book, showered, and was about to slip into bed when he remembered the one part of his routine he had forgotten. Each night, for at least a few minutes, he would call Minami. A pit of dread coalesced in his stomach. He had no idea what to say, or rather, everything he could think of to say would get the call flagged, his phones tapped, and his name brought to the attention of several different authorities. However, if he did begin to draw attention in other ways, there was every possibility they would turn to the automatic butler's records of his activities, and any break in routine could be suspicious. He turned the thought over and over in his head, wondering if he should call, wondering if it would be suspicious not to. This is ridiculous, he muttered to himself, after ten minutes of pacing his room. This is stupid. He turned out his lights and nestled under his covers, refusing to think on the matter any further. Daniel awoke suddenly in the dark, his heart thudding in his ears. He lay perfectly still for the count of thirty breaths, listening intently his eyes wide and staring into the pitch blackness of his room. After a few moments, he could make out the outlines of his windows, dimly picked out in moonlight. He could hear nothing but the low hum of his house around him as it circulated warm air and washed, no, dried, his clothes. Perhaps it was the sound of the washer dropping its load of wet clothes into the dryer beneath that had wakened him, or perhaps some forgotten nightmare. Slowly, carefully, Daniel sat up. The robotic arm of the automatic butler was hovering in his doorway, its shape given away by a glinting sliver of moonlight. Daniel held his breath, not daring to move. The arm was just as still, its three triple-jointed fingers half open, tilted slightly to the side. Daniel got the ridiculous feeling it was watching him. It didn't have eyes, but rather navigated by commands sent from the main program, which had access to the closed-circuit security cameras in the corner of every room. It seemed an eternity later when a cloud scudded over the moon and the room was plunged into blackness. Daniel continued to stare at the space where the arm must have been, trying his hardest to breathe slowly and quietly, wishing his heart would be still, lest the neighbors hear it pounding. 
When the moon came back, however, Daniel's doorway was empty, and he was alone in his room. Fatigue wrapped around him like a blanket, and he settled back into his bed. Just before his heavy eyes closed again, he wondered how many nights the automatic butler had hovered in his doorway, watching him sleep. End of chapter. Next chapter. Minami called at one the next afternoon, asking if he would like to join her for lunch. Daniel hurriedly accepted. He'd been eyeing the cameras in the corners since waking in the morning. The arm had been folded into its slot in the kitchen ceiling, but Daniel had been spooked enough that he'd skipped breakfast. He arrived in the same downtown green space where they'd met to go to the club. She was sitting on the edge of a fountain, her hair draped over one shoulder in a gold-limbed cascade, one hand trailing its fingers in the clear water, her high-heeled sandals leaning against the side of the fountain. Daniel paused and watched her for a moment, thinking how strange it was that he'd met Minami over a year ago, been dating her for six months, and only just found out who she really was two days ago. Hey, he said, walking up to her. She looked up at him and smiled. There you are, she said, rising and embracing him. She whispered into his ear, lips brushing cartilage. Made a decision yet? Getting there, he whispered in reply. She pulled back and pecked him on the lips. So, where do you want to go to eat? Got anywhere in mind? Daniel shrugged. Not that falafel place, he suggested. Oh, why not? Went there yesterday with Brian. Her eyes narrowed. Well, not falafel then. She took his hand. Come on, I know a place. You're paying. Daniel sighed. Good thing I got a raise, supposedly. As she towed him off, she inquired, Supposedly? You know how Suzanne King can be. Only from your descriptions. Did she send you into the tangle again? Yes, which is idiotic because I'm a software engineer. Leave the hardware to the hardware guys. Minami rolled her eyes. If I had a nickel for every time you whined about having to deal with hardware problems, you'd have a lot of useless change. You know they're taking the nickel You know they're taking the nickel out of circulation this year. Really? She stopped, turning to face the nearest building. Well, here we are. It's not awfully expensive, and anyway, I paid for the club, so it's your turn. A little noisy, though, especially the booths in the back. It bumps up against a rail vent, and you know how much those rattle. She squeezed his hand gently. He squeezed back, understanding what she was not saying. The cameras can't hear what we say in here. The restaurant itself was unimpressive looking. Faux brick with stylized pizzeria windows and a neon sign that simply read, Pizza. The place was seat yourself, so he and Minami gravitated to the back upon entering. Around them, the warm smell of baked bread and cheese and marinara sauce filled the air. Minami settled in against the wall, and Daniel sat across from her. She frowned and patted the seat beside her. Come sit over here by me, she requested. I see little enough of you, I don't want to spend the whole meal staring wistfully. Obediently, Daniel rose and circumnavigated the table, settling in next to Minami, who took his hand. On her other side, the wall began to shiver, quickly rising to a loud rattle as an intercity train sped by underneath, sending a plume of air rocketing up through the large hole that backed up on the restaurant. With the cover of the noise, Minami murmured, Each rattle knocks out the sound for ten seconds. That's all the time you get. Got it, said Daniel, just as the sound died away. Minami squeezed his hand under the table. It was twenty minutes until the next train came by, during which they ordered a pizza and made nerve-grating small talk. By the time the wall started to shiver, Daniel was about ready to scream. What's Project 9441? he asked, as the subway shook the cameras into deafness. Why don't you ask Brian? Minami replied. What's Brian got to do with it? It's his project, she hissed just as the sound was dying down. They were halfway through their pizza when the next train came by. Daniel clenched Minami's hand so hard her bio bioelectric tattoos turned on. She hurriedly clicked them back off again. What do you mean it's his project? I mean it's the thing he's working on, you retard. She smiled at him, though her fingernails were digging into the back of his hand. He said that was a secret. He's not allowed to talk about it. Minami shook her head as the train passed. 
As the waitress was laying their check on the table, the third train came rumbling up beneath them. I'll bet you twenty bucks you can get the password from him if you ask him while he's sleeping, she told Daniel. It hit him like a train, zooming blindly through the dark undercity. I think I already did, he murmured, and paid the bill without noticing. As they left the restaurant, Minami suggested they go out to the park for the rest of the afternoon. It's a nice day, as she put it, and it'd be a shame to waste the sunlight. Your tan's wearing off anyway. It's not a tan, he told her. It's my skin. She kissed his cheek, tongue-tying him momentarily. And it's getting awfully pale. Since last summer, you've gone from cappuccino to latte, so don't tell me you don't tan. Daniel sighed. I do occasionally go out in the daytime, you know, he said. The space between your door and the rail station doesn't count as out, she informed him. I will never understand why I love you, he commented. She smiled at him. Someday you might. The park was crowded with children, joggers, cyclists, dogs, and all other man manner of people, but, as always, Minami said she knew a place. It's quiet and out of the way, she told him, then, without moving her lips, and in a blind spot. Good, he said, and added in a fit of weird bravado, I've been meaning to get you alone for days. She snorted at him, pausing to take off her shoes as they stepped onto the vast expanse of green space. At the top of a nearby hill, three huge white windmills ponderously churned the air with gargantuan arms. The other hilltops were dotted with more distant windmills, as though once a great forest of them had marched across the landscape, their glory now faded to a lonely few. The place that Minami knew, as it happened, was at the base of one of the windmills. The two of them arrived at the base of the main tower, winded and sweating, and it was with considerable relief that Daniel seated himself with his back against the cool plastic of the windmill next to Minami. The blades roared and whistled overhead, the wings of jets nailed to a post and forbidden to fly. There's no way this is a blind spot, he commented to her above the noise. Trust me, she said. I've checked and rechecked and triple-checked. That's five checks altogether, Daniel observed. Sure you were thorough enough? In answer, she kissed him full on the lips, her hand cupping his jaw, her breath warm against his face. She smelled of polymerized perfumes expertly concocted to mimic real smells, of metal and glass and ink, and of pizza. When she pulled away from him, he followed her, but she put a finger over his lips. I was thorough enough, she said. Daniel let his head drop against the hard tower behind him with a thunk. Uncomfortable parts of him were doing uncomfortable things. He gently folded his hands in his lap. Okay, he said. I believe you. She sat back against the windmill and laid the very tips of her fingers on his wrist. He took her hand in his and rested his knuckles on the soft grass. They, lay si they sat side by side, looking out at the park for the space of five deep breaths. My butler is spying on me, Daniel said eventually. Everyone's butler is spying on them, Minami replied. They're supposed to. Mine was watching me sleep like the arm and everything, when it was supposed to be turned off. They don't turn off. His jaw clenched. Why am I not surprised? Is there any way someone could have found out what we were doing that night? Any way someone could have heard? Minami shook her head. If there were, we'd already be in prison. Or worse. The government isn't stupid, Minami. Neither am I, Daniel. They're keeping an eye on you because you're a government employee with an awful boss who doesn't get paid enough to keep up with his expensive girlfriend. That's three red flags right there. I wouldn't be surprised if they scheduled you a psychiatry appointment to assess your risk factors. They don't do that. Yes, they do. And anyway, what does that have to do with the damn thing watching me while I sleep? Minami rolled her eyes. Okay, let's slow down here. What exactly do you mean by watching me while I sleep? Because the cameras are always running. The arm was just hanging in my doorway, like it was watching me. The arm doesn't have eyes. It's an arm. Then what the hell was it doing there? 
She shrugged. They're a little buggy. Sometimes I catch mine refolding laundry in the middle of the night. Other times they just freeze. You know how they do. It was creepy. No one's saying it wasn't creepy, and I'm certainly not trying to get you to relax around it. God forbid I should relax at home. She rested her head on his shoulder. You can be a little paranoid sometimes, love, and your imagination runs away with you. He hung his head. That's probably it. After a moment, she asked carefully, placing each word as though building a house of cards. Have you thought about Annika's project? Almost nothing else. A longer pause, the most delicately placed. And? I haven't decided. She exhaled. He couldn't tell with what emotion. Okay, she said. They stayed on the hill and watched the sun set in silence, the great arms of the windmill turning and turning far above them. As darkness fell, Daniel took a deep breath, intending to speak. The words stalled on his tongue, however, and he sighed. In his peripheral vision, he saw Minami turn her head, ever so slightly. No going back now, he thought, and before she could inquire, he said, You never told me you had a brother. It sounded more accusatory than he'd intended. Minami's head turned away by the same fraction it had just turned toward him. She was silent for a long time. Daniel could feel her breathing next to him. No, she admitted at last. I didn't. And there are reasons for that. Will you tell me? More silence, and then... Someday. Okay. Daniel replied. Whenever you want to talk, I'll be here to listen. He had scarcely taken two breaths before she began speaking in a flood, pouring out words upon him in the dark. We were only three years apart. I mean, he was three years older than me. We were like best friends for as long as I can remember. He was always there, looking after me, annoying me, playing games with me, or... We were together all the time. We finished each other's sentences. Sometimes it was like we could read each other's minds. She snorted. <laughs> it was one of our favorite games to try and convince people we had telepathy. Did it ever work? Daniel asked. Minami just smiled and shook her head. I can't say I was happy when he went straight out into the peacekeepers, fresh out of high school. He just left one day. Suddenly he was never around anymore. We barely heard from him. He lived in government housing, ate government food, and we only really saw him on holidays, even though he lived in town. There was a long silence. Daniel looked over. He was shocked to find Minami's face shining with tears. She took a deep breath before continuing. They said he shot an unarmed man. Right through the head. Shot him and killed him. There was a trial, but it was a joke. I went. It was only three days. Can you imagine that? An upstanding keeper never had a black mark on his record before gets up on that stand sweating like... Shinji couldn't lie to save his life. He couldn't lie his way out of a paper bag. I knew him. Knew him like the back of my hand and I knew he was lying when he got up there and told everyone he really did it. I don't know how they couldn't see it. I don't know what they did to make him confess, who they threatened, but he said... I shot him through the head, and he looked right at me, and I could hear him thinking. You know what he was thinking? He was thinking, Mina, help me. Tell them I'm lying. Tell them the truth. And God, I wanted to. I wanted to jump up and scream how stupid they were all being. But I didn't say a damn thing. And then they sent him away to the mines, and a month later he was dead. Her voice broke, and it was a long time before she could speak again. Daniel put an arm around her. When she had learned to breathe again, she said, Before they framed him, he called me. It was two days before, I remember. He said he was going in on something dangerous, something that ran deep. He shouldn't have told me, but he couldn't help it. He had to tell somebody. I think he was looking into the system, and they caught him snooping. So they framed him, shipped him off, and killed him. 
Her voice had turned to steel. They took him from me. And I swear to God, when I find out who's responsible, I will kill them myself. Daniel waited to be sure she was finished. Mean of me? He said at last. When we find out who's responsible, I will hold them down for you. She looked at him with shining, burning eyes. You're in? She asked. He nodded slowly, like a bell tolling. Heart and soul, Minami, he said. Heart and soul. Yay! That was fun. Um, so, thanks again for, um, for watching. Oh god, my foot's asleep! No! I tried so hard to avoid this. Um, but, uh, thank you for watching and listening, um, and, and hanging out with me while I, uh, while I read stuff. Um, again, if you want me to keep reading, uh, just let me know, um, and I definitely will, um, quite happily. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for watching and listening and, um, just being cool. You guys are, you guys are cool. Um, and, uh, I really appreciate you being cool in the same space as me. So, I will hopefully see you guys next time, and, um, bye!